Thank you guys for, uh, for having me. It's my first time in Israel. I'll apologize in advance. I, uh, I only speak English. I, I wish I spoke Hebrew. I think the presentations would have been much more informative for me this morning. Um, and, I will also, uh, a, a, and I will also say that uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be in a community that is as innovative as this one. It's always been on my bucket list to be here, so it's, uh, it's great to be your, your guest. Um, I've been at Google about four years. Uh, prior to that, I was a creative director like you. I grew up on the copy side. I'm a writer. I wrote a novel. And, and, uh, and uh, when I came into Google, I thought the most amazing thing will be I'll, I'll get to go into the secret volcanic lair and I'll see the telepathy helmets and the jetpacks and the teleportation pad. Um, and those things are really cool. I think we are showing a teleportation pad later today. There'll be one upstairs. Um, but the most amazing thing has actually been that I work across agencies and brands, media agencies, creative agencies. Uh, I see three or four or five briefs a week, every single week, week in, week out. So I see what the agency's pitch and the client kills, not just what makes it into market, but I also see what the creative agency pitches and the media agency kills, what the creatives pitch and the account team kills, what the junior creatives pitch and their creative directors kill. Um, and so as a result of that, there's this tremendous creative throughput. Uh, and just looking at that, seeing that across, across every geography and, and every account, you get a tremendous feel of what's genuinely new and innovative and, and what you've seen a hundred times before. So uh, this project that I've worked on called Unskippable Labs is a distillation of that. Um, and its whole purpose is to open up space for you guys to be more creative. So uh, hopefully, hopefully it'll be able to do that for you. Um, I think it is no secret to all of us that we live in a world of incredible media abundance, right? There are hundreds of TV channels, there are billions of hours of content on YouTube, on Netflix, on Kodi. We have access to them in the palm of our hands at any moment of time. And the model that we have built up in our head is, is of information overload, right? That, that, we're, that there's a fire hose of content and we're drowning in it. But that's an old model. If you look back a couple years ago, we were talking about information anxiety and information overload. Those conversations have essentially disappeared. People are in control of their content now. They're in control of the information that comes to them. And consumers, they love it. They cannot get enough. They are swimming in this sea of content now. And we, as advertisers, have not yet adapted. We grew up in a world where attention was abundant and media was scarce, so you could make a beautiful TV commercial uh, and it would penetrate into the minds of millions of people. But now we live in a world where media is abundant and attention is scarce, and we're still trying to break through. We, we imagine, and I've said this, we've all said this to clients, right? We're going to break through the clutter. Well, there is no clutter left. The clutter is all gone. The clutter has been washed away in this ocean of content. And if you're trying to break through the clutter, that doesn't work anymore. So stop doing that. And instead, think, think, think in this way. This is a governing idea of this whole world, this world of abundance we live in. Um, this idea of choice plus immersion. So this world of content that we live in, we have this false model, especially the digital world, that it's about faster, right? We want content faster, faster, faster. All of our, our content is getting compressed. My tweet is 140 characters, except it's not. They just made it longer. My Snapchat is going to last for 10 seconds, except now that you can save them. This is true across all of media. It's not getting shorter. It's getting longer and richer and deeper. You think we live in a golden age of long-form storytelling. They just announced that they're splitting the last season of Game of Thrones into into, into two seasons, right? So now we have, what, 10 years of Game of Thrones, and yet I'm already disappointed that it's going to end two years from now. Hollywood movies are getting longer. They're not getting shorter. They're cut quicker, but they're getting longer 10 minutes on average over the last five years. Books, actually, are not getting shorter. They're getting longer. They have shorter chapters, but the books themselves are longer. And what is this behavior across everything? It is not that I want everything shorter. It is that I want what I want, and when I choose that thing, when I want it, I want a lot of it. I can't get enough of it. I want so much, I want to swim in it. You think, again, poor George R. R. Martin, who's written the Game of Thrones books, he's written 5,000 pages of Game of Thrones, and yet he gets hate mail from his fans if he does anything other than write, right? He shows up for an interview, and they say, finish the books before you die, like you have to write more. This is not a world that wants shorter and shorter content, quicker and quicker content. And so as we make content, as we make ads, and we think this is a world where people want to choose a thing, and the thing that they want, they want a lot of, Ads are not functioning that way. 
Ads are not functioning that way. So imagine I'm happy to spend six, seven, eight, ten hours with, with one piece of media in the course of a weekend, and I will not spend three seconds with your piece of media. That is not an advertising problem. That is a product problem. You're making the wrong product. If people are willing to spend all that time with media, people are not turning away from media. They're diving into media. And the challenge for us as advertisers is that we're bad at both of these things. We're bad at choice because we've never had to be chosen before. And we're bad at immersion because we're used to making this hard, bright diamond of content, right? Compress this idea down, make it so simple, so pure. Well, what happens if you write an amazing ad? If your ad works, right? And I'm moved and, and I'm crying and I want to call my mom or I want to run in the Olympics. How much more is there for me? How deep can I go? Is there a 45 second cut, a 60 second cut? Is there a little bit of B-roll left over from your TV shoot? I want to spend hours with this thing that I love. Please give me a thing that I love and allow me to spend hours with it. So, if you take one thing away from this whole conversation, it is this. The world of media is not a world of faster, faster, faster. We're moving past the things that we don't want faster and faster. But the internet is not made of faster. The internet is made of what we love. And so make things that people love, allow them to choose you, and then allow them to immerse. That is our opportunity, and it's our challenge. None of us have the production budgets that Game of Thrones has, or Mad Men has, or Disney has. So with our budgets and our briefs, we have to make work that people love, that allows it to be chosen, and allow people to, to immerse in it. All right, over the last year, I've run a project called Unskippable Labs. Um, this started with my little team. I think it's very easy to say, oh, Google's a huge place, and you have tons of resources. Well, we had four people, and we had day jobs, and so on and so forth. Um, but as we sat around in our little team, we thought, there are questions about the world of content that we don't understand, and we need to find a way to dig into them. So as I talk about them today, I just want to be clear about what we actually do and don't do. There are teams and teams of people who are doing this foundational work that delivers best practices, right? They look at four or 500 cases, 600 cases, and they deliver foundational work based in science. That is not what I do. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. We do deliberate experiments where we intentionally design creative that plays with specific levers to say, what is the relative power of this or that? What actually happens um, in mobile? What should we actually do? And then we do a little chunk of, of innovation where nobody knows the answer to things. We have no idea what's happening. Um, and I'll take you through a bunch of the experiments that we've done and, and talk about what we found. But please don't mistake the things that we do with this. There are best practices and white papers. We can bury you in them. Um, those things exist. Uh, my team is about experimentation. Uh, and innovation. The founding principle of our team, uh, if you want to understand how the lion hunts, don't go to the zoo. It has never been easier in the world to be out in the world, to live in the world, to find out from actual behavior what people are doing. Please don't sit with people in a room and ask them what they think. You will never get anything as useful as you will get in 24 hours with your work living out in the wild. <clears throat> All right. So um, my team was sitting around, we went into agencies all the time, and we said, oh, you've got to make content, people want content, you need to make it faster, 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 faster. Uh, and I realized we weren't making any content. And I thought, that's not really fair of us to say, here are people with day jobs, you need to make much more content, and we weren't making any. Um, and so we were, we were working with an auto advertiser, they had a beautiful ad, had this gorgeous shot, um, I think it was shot in South Africa, Long highway, incredibly beautiful landscape, and I thought every single person is going to skip that, right? They're going to skip right past it. And so we had this debate about whether we'd pay attention to a face longer uh, or a place longer. So this was our first experiment. This is Charlie. He's on our team. He's sitting. He's drinking a cup of coffee. Um, he's just looking. Uh, he's just looking at the camera. He's not really doing anything. And this is out our designer's window in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And so we shot these things. As you can see, they're masterpieces of the craft. Um, and we, ran, we shot them on a phone, and we ran them on YouTube. And I said to this uh, woman on my team, I said, um, just run them, you know, $100 on my credit card. I figured it'll take a week or two weeks to get $100. Like, who is going to watch this, really? We probably won't get anything. So she comes in the next morning, and she said, um, we got $350 of views last night and these two things. And so then we had to cut it off. Um, but our hypothesis was we would pay attention to a face longer, and we'd pay attention to a face longer on mobile. And so think about not opening your ad with a beautiful, long, slow tracking shot, even if it's of South Africa. 
Um, that played out. So yes, we pay attention to face longer. Yes, we pay attention to face longer on mobile. But the other thing that we didn't understand is we were getting view through rates that were 30, 35%, which if you know anything about your own work, and please know something about your own work, um, those are spectacularly high. They're better than most of the best ads that are out there. And it's this, it's this guy sitting and he's, he's drinking a cup of coffee and he's looking at the camera. There's no music, there's no plot, he doesn't do anything. And so we couldn't figure out what's going on. So we did a second experiment, and this was about framing, about a woman looking straight to camera and then uh, off to the side in sort of classic three-quarter profile. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. So she's an Irish woman on our team, and I said, why don't you recite a Yeats poem, because that's a stereotype, and you know, whatever. Um, but again, we ran it on my credit card, and we said, let's just see, let's just see what happens. Um, we'll pay attention to a face that's looking at the camera that's tightly framed, as opposed to a sort of classic three-quarter profile. And, and this makes sense to us intuitively, right? It's more intimate, it's more direct, we're used to that kind of a address in the world of YouTube. Um, but nobody had known, right? Nobody really knew, we just sort of hypothesized. Um, and then we did an experiment where we took a beautiful uh, high-def clip of a couple driving along and we roughed it up and we put some visual noise in it um, to say, uh, do we want the sort of pure high production value or do we want something that look, looks rougher and, and um, like as if it were shot on the phone. On desktop, view through was the same. On mobile, we preferred this version to that version. Again, we don't know, we don't know why. Is it true with every piece of creative? No, it's not. It's this individual piece of creative. Um, but again, it's a thing that we could explore, we could ask and answer a question, um, and it was the beginning of a process of experimentation that has exploded over the course of the last year. So with that knowledge, we went to advertisers and agency partners and we said, hey, let's figure out um, what's different in the world of mobile? How should storytelling change for mobile? And I think we've inherited a language of TV and film that's come to mobile and now our viewing behavior has gone there, but we haven't asked the question, is this really how stories should be told? How should they change? What's different? We don't know. And it's impossible if you're a creative director and you're being paid $400 an hour to be the smartest person in the room to stand in front of your client and say, I don't have any idea how stories are changing for mobile, and I think that we should learn on your dime. Like, you can't do that. You have to be the person who knows, but we don't have to be the people who know. We can be the people who say, I don't think any of us know, so let's find out. So this is what we did um, with Mountain Dew and BBDO. Should video advertising change for mobile, and if so, maybe some insight into how. So we took an ad that they had done for Mountain Dew. This is the original ad. Nice 30-second spot. Hey, pass me a kickstart. Mountain Dew Kickstart, with two new flavors that taste good. Fun, crazy, right? They're sitting there, they drink the product, they have a crazy explosion, then they go out into whatever they're doing. Nice, it had eight plus million views on YouTube, it's very popular, effective. So the creative director and I, his team, went into an edit suite and we thought, what are different ways we can attack this to say how, what would be different in the world of mobile? Uh, so the first of these is called the big punch. The receive wisdom within the world of BBDO at that point was put your product up front as big and prominent as you can so that even if they skip, it'll stick into that lizard part of their brain. Um, so we cut an ad we called the big punch. And you get it from there, right? It's the rest of the story is there, but at least there's that piece. So that re-edit could be then uh, that much more powerful. Um, but based on the learnings that we had from our experiments, I started to think, well, if a guy, if we will watch a guy, 30% of us will watch a guy sitting and drinking a cup of coffee, and yet we won't watch ads, right? What is it about that? What is the mystery there? And my personal hypothesis, did you note there's a big asterisk? My personal hypothesis um, is that we have a sort of immune system that's built up for advertising, and when I recognize a thing that definitely looks like an ad, I immediately want to skip. My impulse is that this is going to suck, I'm not going to, it's not going to be worthwhile, and I want to skip. But if we see a thing and we don't have any idea what it is, maybe we'll pay attention longer. So the third of these, they made us rebrand as pure fun. We originally called the anti-ad, right? What if you threw out all of the rules of advertising and cut something that looked 
totally different. So in this, you're dropped in, you have no idea what's going on, the music hasn't started. The voice you hear is actually the creative director in the edit suite, he's improvising um, to what you see. Uh, and we also thought, well, if you like it, why don't, we why don't we have it run longer? Why do we need a 30, 45? Like, let's just keep it going and see what happens. So this was originally called the anti-ad, we rebranded re as Pure Fun, and I'll, I'll let that run a little bit longer. Shoulders, check. Hips, check. Here we go. And it goes on from there. It goes on from there. So those were our three ads. What do you think would happen? What do you think would happen? We ran these. We ran them on desktop. We ran them on mobile. We did, we did brain lift to see, actually, what, what would occur out in the wild. Well, first, view through on desktop. The same for all three. Which, you can say, oh, it's, you know, it's the same music and it's the same clip, but it's sort of amazing, actually, that this super random thing that you may have a glitch that we put together in the afternoon on edits, so we did as well as this spot that was tightly polished that you spent six months in post correcting, making gorgeous, et cetera, but whatever, view through on desktop, okay, the same. On mobile, almost 30% higher for pure fun. Almost 30% higher, and again, think like, this is an afternoon in the edit suite. It's not like we rewrote, we reshot, we reconcepted. And so that for us was a clue. There's something different going on here. Well, what did it actually mean for the brand? The ad recall for these two was significantly higher, 54% higher. So we remember that we'd seen an ad, but the brand awareness was the same. No difference across the three. And the big lesson of these two is not, oh, there's a magic way that you can cut ads and work on mobile, but you don't know the answer, and I don't know either. There's something going on here, and you need to pay attention to what your goals are. If you think that ads work by sticking a, 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 an image in your lizard brain and you remember it when you're on the shelf, as some people believe ads work, if you think ads is about persuasion and so on, then maybe you want to tell a different kind of story. But what this showed us was that there's variance in the way that stories work and what we absorb and what we pay attention to. Um, and the last of these, we watched Pure Fun uh, more than twice as long. More than twice as long. And in fact, 109, which was the average viewing time, is the exact moment that that table slow jam ends. And my hypothesis is when we went back to a thing that looked like what we'd seen before, we were like, okay, I've seen this, and now I'm gonna skip out. And if you re-edited it after the slow jam, once you knew that people were leaving then, then you could get higher brand uh, awareness, higher favorability. Um, and, a better, and a better ad response. So this was our first experiment, and there's a case study up in a film. Um, you can watch all three, you can watch all three again. Uh, but the key finding, ads don't need to be shorter. Mobile is not about shorter, they can be longer, they can be stranger. Mobile, again, what did I choose, what did I want, what did I watch, what did I immerse in? Um, so mobile is not just about quicker. The second uh, we did with L'Oreal Paris, the agency came to us and said, uh, L'Oreal is having a great time with uh, older audience, but they're struggling with the younger audience. They're not creating a connection. We think the problem is the kind of content that we make. Um, can you help us explore how people of different ages respond to different types of content? So uh, we started with a TV commercial. I'll play you a little bit of it. This is very traditional, perfectly beautiful uh, ad for, for L'Oreal Paris La Palette Nude. What makes beauty different than any other art form is this is more of a canvas in motion. Beautiful, right? It's beautiful, gorgeous shot, it's models on the runway, et cetera, et cetera. That was the first one. Um, the second one is a beauty blogger. Uh, it was a how-to, but shot with beautiful production values, uh, very nicely done in the L'Oreal brand style.
And then it goes on from there, it was 254, but you get a sense, right? This is L'Oreal's attempt to do a L'Oreal style how-to. Um, and then we shot a sort of UGC looking how-to in the supply closet of a production company. We took the script exactly from the second video to the third video, so it's literally the same content. It's just this perfectly nice but relatively ordinary looking person um, explaining how to do uh, a look. Check it out. I'm going to show you how to get the perfect eyeshadow look for date night in just a few easy steps. I'll be using L'Oreal Paris La Palette Nude number one. She's designed to look like a YouTuber, but she's not. She has no following, so it's not about some inherent audience that she had um, behind her. All right, so the view through rates, very interesting for me. The branded ad did the best for all ages, right? 18 to 24 and 35 to 44, the two ends of the spectrum. So everyone watched the TV commercial the most which is not what I was expecting, but it's interesting to see. Okay, good. How about the ad response? Look at this exactly opposite ad response. So for the younger audience, did okay on ad recall with the TV commercial, but almost 100% better for the UGC looking commercial. So totally different response. And for the older audience, much stronger uh, ad response to the TV commercial and almost no response to the UGC looking. And so view through rate, Roughly the same, everyone responded to this one, and yet almost exactly opposite demographic response. Different people, and I think if you think about the younger audience, right, 18 to 24, this is the most sophisticated media audience in the history of time. It's entirely plausible that they would watch a thing and not remember it, right, in one eye and out the other. Um, the challenge of this for L'Oreal is, the third video does not look like L'Oreal. That is not building the L'Oreal brand, and yet it is the thing that their audience is responding to overwhelmingly. And so as we think about how these companies are going to build brands in the future, if we are following the user, what does that look like and feel like? And what does it mean for a brand like L'Oreal, one of the most storied brands in the world? Um, I think that the thing that this taught me is you need to look beyond view through rate. You really need to dig in. You need to cut by device. You need to cut by age. Um, again, there's a lot that we don't understand out there, and there is no silver bullet, right? There's no magic. This ad works fantastically well. There's too much data. There's too much information, but it's not just about that. It's about the insight that sits behind that. Um, the most recent of our large-scale experiments is about length. We get asked this question all the time, how long should my ad be? Um, and so we ran uh, three commercials, a 15, a 30, and a two-minute, um, all of exactly the same spot, just edited for different lengths to see the response. I'll give you, uh, this is for, uh, for Honeymaid. Uh, I'll give you a little taste. When, uh, when you first come here to America, you're kind of like invisible. You don't seem to be noticed, but at the same time, you see that they're looking at you. It's a beautiful documentary style story of this family, a celebration of the family playing together. It ends with them making s'mores um, and the honey made brand message, this is wholesome. So, the response, the shortest, the 15 second spot was not the most unskippable. People watched the 30 second more than they watched the 15 second, even though it was half the length. People will watch a better story, they will choose the story that they like the most. They watch the long, both of the long forms longer than they watch the 15 second. And for me, that reinforced that idea of, I have an immune system, it feels like an ad, I wanna skip it. If you're telling me a story that's interesting, I may, I may choose to watch it. Ad recall and brand favorability. So the 15 second spot, overwhelmingly more effective at ad recall, and yet there is no no movement on favorability. So, very high on ad recall, I saw your ad. Did it change my opinion of, of your product? Not at all. Again, this is about goals. Is your goal recall or favorability? Very low ad recall for the longer form, but much higher favorability. Um, and particularly telling for me, um, the favorability for the long form ad, they didn't have the brand appear in any form until almost a minute and 17 seconds into that ad. So you really had to watch almost all of it before you had any idea that there was any brand and what that brand was. And I think, again, with more editing, if we had gone in further and deeper, we could have understood a lot, a lot more of that. But there's a lot going on here in the way that, that people respond to stories um, that I think opens up a lot of, a lot of creative possibilities for us. Um, two new experiments, we just published 360 video, is it worth it? This is not, hey, is 360 cool? It is what actually happens to the brand, what do people watch, um, and what is the effectiveness when you do 360? Um, and then skippable and forced view. What's the difference between a video that you choose to watch versus a video that you're forced to watch? Um, what difference does it have for the brand? Those are out, they are public. Um, we can send you links. 
Um, one of the other sort of children of Unskippables, we had Mars come to us last year and say, oh, we've got all this trouble with our agencies. They're not agile enough. We want to challenge them in a new way. So we brought uh, 10 creative teams around the world into our YouTube spaces. We gave them the same brief. They had 48 hours to make spots, 48 hours to uh, write, shoot, edit, produce, deliver and 48 hours for the client to approve in that same stretch. This was very revealing for me because the clients were like, yes, challenge the agencies, make them work faster, they're really slow. And we're like, okay, great, you need to approve in the same 48 hours. And they were like, are you crazy? We can't possibly do. And so suddenly you see the ecosystem where the clients were like, agency's bad, make them faster. Um, and we were like, you need to be faster. This is a shared responsibility to make this work, work better, to work harder. Um, they had to make a different kind of brief, a better brief. They had to get their legal teams on board that they would uh, create approval in 48 hours. So these are the ads. You can see them all online. Um, they created them all. Are they any good? Well, four of the 10 ads were in the top 25% of all ads on YouTube last year. So yes, in 48 hours, you can create great ads um, with a client who is ready, agencies who are ready, etc. We do not, we do not believe that every, shot should be, every spot should be created in 48 hours. Please don't let your clients take away um, that learning from this. I will tell them tomorrow, do not do that. We do not think that that is the role to get to good work. But we do think there's a lot of muscle memory built up in clients and agencies that prevent work from being made in, in new and innovative ways. Um, and then the last of the examples in this, uh, Disney, as they saw the uh, Unskippables work, what they started to do is they started to pre-run their TV ads on YouTube to say, let's understand how people of different ages and affinities are responding. Um, so they cut six ads, they ran them against six demographics and 12 affinities to say things like, what do women who are 25 to 44 who are interested in fashion and beauty respond to? And they changed the creative as a result of that and they also changed their, uh, their uh, TV spend so they said, wow, uh, women who are 25 to 44 into fashion are really responding to this. Um, we're going to heavy up our spend in the channels that are associated with that um, and shape the creative accordingly. So we're starting to see clients really rethink how creative comes to market um, based on this kind of experimentation. <clears throat> All right, that's enough of the experimentation. Let's get the innovation. Um, this is the stuff where we really don't have any answers. We really don't know what's going on. Um, and, we're really, and we're really exploring. One of the key areas of this for me is mobile. Again, I think we've inherited this language language of TV and film. We don't really know what's going on. And so I thought we should explore that a little bit more directly. So we deliberately wrote a set of, of ad-like objects designed to be fairly anonymous, designed to be fairly generic, um, and, and manipulated very specific variables to say what is important in this and what is not. So this first one is about pacing. Don't you hate it when you just get stuck? You try this, you try that. Nothing seems to work. You ask the internet, nothing. You ask the internet again, but differently. Maybe you even ask an actual human. Nobody seems to know. How can I get the help I need? I'm stumped. That's how I was. And then I found the thing. Looks like a box. It's not. Well, it is a box, but that's not the thing. It's the thing. And the thing about the thing is it unsticks the stuck no matter how stuck you are. I want one. Of course you do. It's the thing. Okay, so it's not a masterpiece of craft, but it allows us to do a certain specific kind of experimentation. That's version one and here's version two. Don't you hate it when you just get stuck? You try this and you try that, but nothing seems to work. Left, right, up, down, nothing. You ask the internet. Nothing. You ask the internet again. But differently. Maybe you ask an actual person. Your peculiar neighbor. That friendly barista. Nobody seems to know. You're stumped. That's how I was. Until I found the thing. Looks like a box. But it's not. Well, it is a box. But that's not the thing. It's the thing. And the thing about the thing is it unsticks the stuck. No matter how stuck you are. Want one? Of course you do. It's the thing. So that's pacing, we did pacing, we did framing tight and wide to see what the variables are, we did orientation horizontal and vertical, um, we did color. This is, a, it was an interesting one for me because we, yeah, we put them in, in, in brighter shirts, but also maybe hard to see with the screen. I, I said to them, make their skin tones almost artificial, like super saturate, super saturate the colors. We don't have all the, di the data digested yet, but pacing is extremely important. The faster pace, 
uh, the faster pace cut did much better. And it did much better on mobile, and it did much better with people who were 18 to 25. And I think that in that sort of choice plus immersion, we're digesting information super fast. There is more room to tell a story faster than we think that there is, that our sense of timing may be conditioned by TV in a way that our audience may not. Um, this also did extremely well. I was actually surprised by how well it did. I think you can understand sort of intellectually why that might be in that, um, you know, we have our phones, the light is variable, it may be bright, we may have the, the, the um, screens turned down in order to save battery life, but there is something about the saturated color that did extremely well on mobile. It may be worth thinking about the next time you sit in an edit suite and the lights are down low and you have a giant beautiful screen and you're looking at your beautiful gorgeous edit, um, it may not be the best thing for your customer who is, who is on a mobile phone. We have not, as I said, digested all this out, but we're going to publish it. We're actually going to publish the cuts out, so you guys can run your own tests if you want to, or I encourage you to do this. Again, we wrote these in a couple of days. We shot them in a day. We ran them live during con. We just got data back, so you can find these things out. It's not incredible, elaborate, uh, complex. You could shoot them yourselves and, and run them on your credit card. I just would encourage you not to let them run too long, because uh, you'll spend more money than you thought. There is this world of ad tech and programmatic and big data, and as creatives, we feel constrained by it. It's going to box us in. It's going to say, oh, only put the logo here and only show it for four seconds. And that's the wrong, that's the wrong way to think about it. This world of data is opening up new ways of imagining stories and telling stories. And the problem is not a technical problem. It's an imaginative problem. So for you guys as creatives, the amazing work um, that is waiting to be done is much better than the work that we have had the opportunity to do. And I hope our Unskippable Labs does a small part of that. I, I like to say data is waiting for its Scorsese or waiting for that big imagination in order to figure out how to use this data to tell better stories. I hope it's with you guys. I hope it's in this room. I hope a year from now I come back and you're telling the most amazing stories ever. Um, I end always with this. The amazing work we all want to do is on the other side of yes, on the other side of I want to experiment, I want to try, on the other side of I don't know, on the other side of let's figure it out. So please don't think that you know. Figure out how to experiment. Hopefully we can do um, amazing sp experiments with you um, and we'll all do better work uh, as a result. Um, next up is my colleague Netta. Uh, we both work in the world of insights and figuring out how the world works, but hers is the deeper, richer side of, of human stories, so she's going to share uh, some of those insights with you. But thank you very much. Thank you.